I think every leftist understands that liberals are inherently antagonistic towards them. What are you talking about? What leftist is like saying, oh man, we, you know, we love liberals. Like there's nothing we can do. I think that the, the sobering examination of American politics requires you to come to terms with the reality that we have a duopoly. Let's get back to the real world. Why does baldness scare you? First of all, I do not have internalized bald phobia. What I do have, on the other hand, is bald fetishization. You can call me out for the correct thing. If you were to say, Hassan, why do you fetishize the bald so much? That makes sense. That's valid. Okay, I do. I do fetishize the bald a little bit too much. But if you were to say, yeah, we're going to watch the by donkeys, don't worry, led by donkeys. Let's get now in studio is pollster and communication analyst Frank Luntz. He's been tracking voters in... Hasanabi Moot, Frank Luntz. Focus groups with the New York Times throughout 2024. And Once again, I just want to repeat that like Frank Luntz is a right-wing pollster and is a right-wing messaging guy. So just so you understand how like far, how right-wing American media is in general, before you say like, oh, well, as a right-wing guy, don't you think that he could have a, a, an accurate assessment of like things that are going on? He could like focus group. It's always going to, it's always going to have the biases Okay, and uh, it is, it should ring some alarm bells, I think, for people, maybe, that are Democrats. What? That is an insane statement that you just said. It's a bit too much. That, that tweet that you sent me was, was a bit much. Okay, I clicked on it, I read it, and I was like, okay, I can't read that out loud. And it's here with some insights on what unfolded in this historic election. So, Frank, before we get to your focus groups... Um, you admitted quite candidly that you were wrong about something major after the election. You thought this election, if I have you right, was over after the debate between Kamala Harris and Donald Trump. What happened? It simply wasn't. And in the end, the debate did not matter. The public is used to what Trump says. They did not hold it against him. The dogs and cats, which people made fun of memes were created. It did not impact people because... And one of the things that we have to acknowledge is the importance of the truth. We have to tell it. Well, that was not the truth when he said that. No, and, and I thought that would kill him, but it didn't. And one of the things that really matters in elections going forward is we have the responsibility to tell them the truth and they have the right to get the truth. And quite frankly, we are a different country today than we were even eight years ago. What we judge people by, sometimes it's ignoring the information becomes more important than what you say. And that was the challenge with him. I'm going to keep repeating the same point over and over again. As material, as material conditions worsen, as people feel more and more anxious and more upset about their circumstances, and as nobody, as uh, no one seemingly responds to those issues, uh, if the other side is at least like acknowledging and addressing their anger and then channeling it towards whatever avenue they see fit, okay? They're not going to give a fuck about the virulent racism. And sometimes they're going to actually lean into that racism. They're going to believe the racism, okay? A lot of people will, uh, a lot of people will turn around and say, no, you don't understand. America's just like irredeemably racist. There's nothing we can do about it. And it's very frustrating to leave it at that. Harris, she didn't say enough. All right, all right. So let's, let's get to your uh, focus groups. You did a, a series of focus groups with the young voters uh, who were persuadable, undecided, late in the summer, and then you went back right before the election after they had voted. It's so sad that the American left constantly capitulates and supports libs to defeat the far right, and now libs are like, no, f leftists, we don't want them. No, I think every leftist understands that liberals are inherently antagonistic towards them. What are you talking about? What leftist is like saying, oh, man, we, you know, we love liberals, like there's nothing we can do. I think that the, the sobering examination of American politics requires you to come to terms with the reality that we have a duopoly. We have two capitalist parties that represent bourgeois interests, that represents the interests of capital, right? Represents corporate interests only above all else. And that uh, regardless of that, your goal should be to try and force at least one of the two parties into adopting certain frameworks that you have been advocating for. If you can't get the party, the establishment of the party, to 
recognize that. Is this not the same as economic anxiety excuse? No. The reason why it's not the same as the economic anxiety excuse is because I'm not excusing the racism. I'm very correctly calling it out every single day. My problem is when we talk about the solutions to this, okay, when we talk about the solutions to this, I always tell you one thing. You should never be, you should be uncompromising in defending marginalized communities, but you should also understand where people become more vulnerable, okay? If you don't recognize that economic volatility, economic instability, and, and people feeling like uh, they have a worse future presented for them uh, than the previous generation, they are going to be infinitely more susceptible to reactionary framing on issues, okay? That's why I am a firm and committed advocate for Medicare for All, for example. And I always say Medicare for All means all, including Nazis, right? There is no, like, Medicare except the people I hate. Because the goal there is to, at the very least, improve people's material conditions unconditionally so that they are less susceptible to reactionary framing. This does not mean that this will magically cause racism to perish, okay? It doesn't. It doesn't mean that at all. And there will be people who fight tooth and nail every step of the way. But one, it is the right thing to do regardless, okay? Because everyone deserves a life of dignity. And two, the goal is to eliminate the, the underlying problems that make people more susceptible to right-wing framing in an environment where white supremacist attitudes are taken for granted. That's why Republicans can so easily point to things that are going on, like uh, pre-existing oppressive structures, and say, that's just common sense. That's just common sense. We want more of this common sense. Early. Uh, let's play a little bit of the conversation we have with them. This was on Zoom. I want to play just a short clip. How many of you, by show of hands, disliked both candidates? Do you have a negative opinion of both? It is literally... Every single person here, what does that say to you about American democracy, that you didn't like the Republican or the Democrat? Yes, you go first. I, I mean, I think it just shows how polarized we've become and that, I mean, people vote based on... Is it polarized, honestly? I feel like, doesn't it sound like you guys are in unison, collectively decided that you're not polarized? That just, like, both of the parties suck and don't represent your best interests? their party over country. And I mean, it's just, it's unfortunate to see. I don't think we'll ever see another election in our lifetime, where there's one candidate that truly wins in a Reagan landslide. Harris ran on the platform of, I'm not Trump. And that's not enough to be a president. You need to have more than, well, I'm better than this person. You gotta explain how you're gonna fix our democracy, how you're gonna make the United States a better place. And I didn't get that from her. And if she's saying, I'm just gonna do everything the same as Biden, well, then I have concerns, too, because I'm not really happy with the direction that our country is going in terms of inflation and other issues in our economy. And that was actually the day after the election. So bottom line, what was the factor with these people that were undecided and then broke against Kamala Harris? They did not like either candidate. That was clear. They thought that Trump was offensive and abusive in his language and polarizing. But in the end, she didn't answer the question that they wanted to know. What are you going to do in the first hour? in the first day, in the first week, the first month, and so on. They felt they had the right to hear this, and if she won't tell them that, then they couldn't give her their vote. And other voters, not just the young voters, felt that she wasn't. She never came clean with what she wanted to do, and the fact that she changed her positions on some issues, she never really explained it. She talked too much about Trump. It was what too much was. defining what Trump was. Not John, defining herself. And John, we all know what Trump is. We experienced him for four years. Whoever told her to focus on him committed political malpractice. Because in the end, you cannot change someone's point of view on him. It was all about her. Okay, there's been a, there was a lot of talk about the gender gap throughout this uh, campaign, usually focusing on how she was doing on women and Trump's problems with women. But you spent some focus groups talking with men uh, who, who, who had voted for Hillary Clinton, they had voted for Joe Biden, and then they voted for Donald Trump. He was their voice. They, in him, they saw someone who represented them. And with her, they saw, and it was great, young women getting excited for the first time, surrounded by women, talking about issues like abortion. 
That was great for the female vote, but men felt ignored, they felt forgotten, and they felt like they, they didn't even matter. And in the end, the Democratic Party has to keep both of them. It is not enough to get, capture the women's vote. These middle class, middle income, moderate men, I call it M cubed, they're the key to any election, and they felt betrayed by her. Okay, so before you go, what, what do Democrats have to do to get competitive again? How do you win when you lose the union vote? They had the union leadership, but not the union membership. How do you win if you lose Latinos? In fact, a majority of Latino men voted for Trump. 52%. It's incredible how many traditional Democrats, and the reason why is that she became ideological and what they want is simple. Abortion was a great thing to run on, but you also need to run on issues like effect, affecting like all the economy. Look, the campaign was cooked from the start because of Joe Biden. And Joe Biden was cooked from the start because Democrats do not highlight some of the good things that they've done. They just assume that people will figure it out on their own. That's why it was very frustrating for someone like myself even, who is very antagonistic to the administration, for a multitude of different f that they engaged in that like myself and maybe majority report were some of the few places where you actually heard about Biden administration's accomplishments. Like think about that. MSNBC was far too predisposed throughout the duration of this administration with like a whole bunch of weird nonsense. I suspect instead of genuinely, genuinely highlighting some of the accomplishments of the administration because yeah, secular talk as well. Like pre-October 2023, there was a lot that you could point to with respect to the, the accomplishments of the administration. And I certainly did in moments where they did deserve praise. Okay. But throughout the year, you're supposed to do that all the time. It can't be like the Biden's wins account, which is also, uh, which also featured a litany of, of ridiculous nonsense as well. Like the Biden administration was running at least up until a certain point. I would say maybe even before the midterms on a, a anti-corporate billionaire populist strategy. They were directly antagonistic to a lot of big businesses. And yet they were too afraid of describing that. They were too afraid of showcasing that. They were too afraid of even like beefing up the vibes on that front. But ultimately, there was also a lot of stuff that they did that was really bad, really wrong, okay? And why do they rest on their laurels? I don't know. But, but, but that's besides the point anyway, because even someone like myself who is pro-labor union is still not going to overlook the fact that they ran with an incredibly right-wing anti-immigrant strategy that I am completely against, okay? that I think was both parts bad politics and bad policy. And I said it over and over and over again from the moment that they unveiled their right-wing immigration package. Besides that point, though, there was a necessity for expanding the existing welfare state that they simply, uh, they, they simply let expire in many instances, right? SNAP benefits, uh, child tax credits, like profoundly popular expansions of the welfare state were left behind. And they never chose to punish the Republicans for it. And as a matter of fact, if you recall my early uh, assessment, my early analysis, even during the IRA build back better struggle that was happening within Congress, if you go back and watch some of my old videos from that time frame. I was so consistently yelling at the Democratic leadership for not punishing the spoilers from within, okay? There were a lot of moments where it seemed like the Democrats were in a state of panic and in a state of disorder because Joe Manchin was f***ing up the strategy. And instead of whipping those votes, instead of coming down with the strength of the state to ensure that Joe Manchin played ball, okay? What is this? Here's you getting mad in June before the infamous like debate. Biden. I hate Biden. Biden is a idol freak. Am I talking about his fucking dubs? And he's not. Think about that. What the fuck are they doing? I cover the news and I 
and I have a close, I, I watch closely what the Democratic Party is doing and what the re-election campaign is doing. And I promise you, I promise you, I fucking despise Biden, as you guys know, okay? I have talked significantly more about this administration's W's than the administration itself. What the fuck is going on? Yeah. If you go back, if you go back even further in time, during the Build Back Better conversations that were taking place, I also regularly yelled about the fact that I also regularly yelled about the fact that like Democrats were not whipping these votes internally. And that was making it seem like it was actually the Democrats fault that there was gridlock when it was always the Republicans that were universally against all of these uh, uh, policy accomplishments that would be helpful for every American. Republicans rarely have issues with that sort of thing with the, with the rare exception of like uh, John McCain refusing to strike down uh, uh, Obamacare, refusing to destroy Obamacare. And it's, you know, outside of that very unique circumstance, Republicans are almost always in unison. Democrats never communicated their, their uh, accomplishments throughout the year. They just never, they never campaign year round in the way that the Republicans do. Republicans are never, Republicans never stop campaigning. So not only are they bad across the board. Oh, here, this was, I am so I, I'm like, I hate her so much. Not only did she vote against uh, increasing the $15 minimum wage because the working poor, I'm talking about Kirsten Cinema, or but uh, she did it in like the worst way possible. Like she did it in the quirky, ooh, ooh look at me, I'm a bisexual Gemini way. People are going to like, that's right going to, love, that's going to trigger that. the out of so many people like obviously some of them are not going to go and like join the republican party because like someone decided to do a very conservative thing in the democratic party but my god dude like i mean i'll just show you senator cinema voting no on the minimum wage amendment so disrespectful dude like this is some real us girl shit, dude i mean it literally feels like she was just doing it specifically so she gets this kind of backlash yeah she thought it was her mccain moment like all you're doing is creating more of a rift between those in the middle class, lower middle class, or maybe even like upper middle class, and uh, people who are poor. The working poor pitted against the middle class Americans who feel like they are not getting something out of the government that they thought that they were about to get for no reason whatsoever, because absolutely zero people were like, honestly, we really need to limit the scope of this. Like, who the f who was making that argument? Republicans certainly weren't. Republicans are too busy talking about Mr. Potato Head's cock, okay? That's literally all Republicans have been talking about. They are so insanely hyper-focused on the culture war shit because they realize that, like, taking a stand, especially in the aftermath of the Trump administration, taking a stand against left-wing economic populism is not going to be good. You think Republicans are going to go out and uh, uh, talk to their newly acquired base or their newly galvanized uh, base of support and tell them like, well, actually, uh, Friday, we need austerity we measures and Republicans we need to be a little bit more responsible because the deficit this, the deficit that. Like, cute. no, that's not. Republicans know that they can't do that. So they talk about Mr. Potato Head's no. cock and they talk about Dr. Seuss. That's Excuse why they've been doing this while there's an ongoing conversation. So let me ask you all this, okay? If you love the Democratic Party, if you literally jerk off the photos of Nancy Pelosi because you have a shrine dedicated to her because you think the Let's Democrats are the best thing that's ever happened even if you feel that way even if you're the number one democratic party supporter okay explain to me how the f it is acceptable for democrats to just take l's over and over again because of a couple psychopaths in their own f ranks that literally want to spoil a very popular policy that was the center of the democratic national campaign like this is what joe biden ran on joe biden ran on increasing the minimum wage 15 dollars an hour okay joe biden and and georgia directly tied to two thousand dollar stimmies what are you doing why are you trying to show people like well okay we are uh we're, we're actually so f bad that even when we claw our way into power uh we are not going to fight for it all the way to the end tooth and nail and and put up an honest to god and even push for it and even successfully uh, get this uh, rammed through. Democrats never fight as hard as Republicans do for the action. Just want to remind everybody that $15 minimum wage just passed in the state of Missouri. $15 minimum wage passed in the state of Missouri with a ballot measure. Now tell me, this is my analysis from 
uh, March 5th, 2021, uh, including paid sick leave too. Think about that. Oh. Missouri, on the other hand, did not vote blue. What's that about? Actual policy taxes. goals that they run on. Republicans run on cutting taxes. They cut it. It doesn't matter. They will kill motherfuckers if they have to. But they're, they're going to cut those tax. Democrats don't do that. And I'm not seeing a lot of spoiler talks from the National Democratic Party currently in regards to Kirsten Cinema, Joe Manchin, Hassan, and all these other fucking senators and, and, and congresspersons that are operating as spoilers on a very popular uh, policy that 60% of the country wants, even 60% of the constituents in, in West Virginia want, for example. So what's up? Whenever the left is uh, playing the spoiler because they want to secure more benefits for the uh, working class, they are uh, lambasted. You, you bring out every- You could have played this on election night? Yeah, I mean, I can- I can just play you all my old videos. That's it. I should just do a rerun channel where I just play all my old fucking takes on every single issue so that people understand that I've been consistent on this stuff for uh, the longest time. And you can tell this from a while ago because one, I'm in my old apartment and two, I'm fat as fuck. Hi, a down. Every Democratic talking head to go on national news and shit all over That's the fucking uh, progressive caucuses and all the progressives are like, oh, they're so silly. They're so silly. Why are they spoiling all this? But when Joe Manchin does this, where the fuck is the rest of the Democratic Party shitting on Joe Manchin? Huh? Why are they not applying you, pressure to Joe Manchin? Why are they not applying pressure to cinema? Why are they not talking about how these guys are literally pitting the Democratic Party's electoral success? If you don't care about the fucking working poor, because uh, a lot of libs, unfortunately, quite frankly, do not. They only claim to care about it, so they feel morally superior, but they don't actually care about it. So if you don't care about the working poor, but you care about the success of the Democratic Party because that's your fucking team and this is team sports yes. and you want to own the cons, then why the fuck are you allowing Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema and a couple other dipshits that are supposedly centrist to ruin this process? Please explain that to me. Almost self-aware. I, I love when dumbasses come in here and think that I'm just like some fucking silly lib and uh, uh, are like, oh, wow, look at him criticizing the Democratic Party. What an own. Bitch, I criticized the Democratic Party while you were protein in your dad's balls, okay? Shut the fuck up. So they are just hurting their midterm chances. If they don't care about anything else, it's just midterm chances and they are hurting it, okay? That's great. It's great. You're, you're allowing an opening for the Republicans to literally not take a position at all on the $15 minimum wage. You are allowing Republicans to not come out and say it with their chest that they don't think the working poor deserve $15 an hour. You're literally letting them get away. You lost his aura, bro. This is why I always laugh when people say, Hassan, um, I used to like him quite a bit, but over the years I realized what a, what a radical he is, or I used to like him quite a bit, but his positions changed quite dramatically. It's like, no dumbass, you changed, okay? No, you changed. You started watching fucking drama perverts and you started filtering all of the all of the opinions that I have through an inherently negative lens. And then you became you became this fucking massive hater. That's it. I have direct evidence that these positions have remained the fucking same throughout the years, throughout when you first started watching me. That's the problem. That's the issue. The issue is I was right back then. I'm still fucking right now. I've been saying this exact same uh, I've been saying this exact same stuff for the past decade at this point. The only thing that changed is you got algorithm duped into watching like one drama video and then your entire, your entire YouTube feed turned into a F Hassan fuck fest, a fuck Hassan fuck fest. And you now do not actually uh, have the capacity to listen to what I'm saying or even acknowledge the things that I was saying that you used to agree with. And your worldview slowly but surely changed on top of that. It's laughable. It is laughable when people say this stuff. Just like it's laughable when they're like, oh, dude, you're a grifter. You're a grifter. It's like, yeah, dude. I decided. I decided to grift in the worst way possible by putting myself in front of a, a community that is uh, oftentimes directly in support of the things that I'm advocating for, but will still find like minor disagreements to, to yell at me over. Okay? Yeah. If I was a grifter, I would just grift right wing. It's the easiest thing to do. You don't have to be charismatic. You don't have to be smart. 
You can just say the things, right? Or if I wanted a national media presence, I could just be a liberal, okay? If I can sell you an idea that is that most people are inherently antagonistic towards, like a socialist vision, a socialist alternative, then why the fuck do you think I can't sell you on liberalism? It's already something that half the country takes for granted. It's all they read. It's all they see in mainstream media. Or conservatism, which is, again, all people on the other side of the political spectrum see and hear in uh, mainstream media. It, with quietly opposing it, because the entire for independent media, liberalism uh, is is, in my opinion, for independent media, if you were going to go that route, conservatism is a way easier one to do than liberal, because at the end of the day, liberal perspectives are are so common, liberal perspectives are so easy to find, so differentiating yourself from like MSNBC is going to be hard. Some people do that by being super edgy and advocating to uh, say the N-word as a white guy because they genuinely believe that you should be able to do that, for example. Or highlighting Nazis and cultivating a community of fucking 4chan losers. Some people do that. But even then, to varied success, it's not always very successful. However, what is objectively easy to do is just to be a right winger to just be racist to just constantly complain about how uh, there's diversity and representation in all of the culture and art that you consume and that sucks and it makes you feel like a victim that you're a victim of society you are being victimized that's the easiest thing to do and in the independent media route there's a massive massive lane for you conversation revolves around the uh, dumbass uh, supposedly centrist democrats that are enough Two of them that are enough to fucking ruin this entire process. Anyway, why do you think the Democrats are much more feeble than Republicans? Because they're controlled opposition. They just are. They are controlled opposition. So we've established that there is a uh, bad optics of the situation. Um, I don't even think I need to get into the bad policy part of the situation that like we don't have the fifteen dollar minimum wage because it's not going to pass in a. Uh, it's not going to pass while the filibuster exists in the Senate. It's not. It's just not going to fucking happen. So that's why this was a one opportunity, one shot. Do not miss your chance to blow. Uh, a type of uh, ordeal for the $15 minimum wage. And uh, stop we giving a shite. Thank you for the 10. Give the subs. Fucking blew it. It's great. Uh, fucking awesome. Uh, Senator Cinema says this was her statement. Senator Cinema, I understand what it's like to face tough choices while working and meet your family's most basic needs. I also know the difference better, better wages can make, which is why I helped lead Arizona's effort to pass an index minimum wage in 2006 and strongly supported the voter approved state minimum wage increase in 2016. No person who works full time should live in poverty. Senators in both parties have shown support for raising the federal minimum wage and the Senate should hold an open debate. And Yeah, anyway, um, this video was published on March 15th, 2021. It wasn't just Kirsten Cinema. it was Joe Manchin, it was Maggie Hassan. There's always like a, a rotating squad of villains. Bob Menendez. And the Democratic Party doesn't do anything to secure their votes. The Republican Party would never allow such a thing, okay? They don't. Yeah, and under the Obama administration, you had Joe Lieberman. But like, my point is, Democrats also personally advance the interests of these people, okay? Harris got the endorsement of Beyonce, JLo, Eminem. I thought at least those celeb campaigning will move the needle a bit. No, fuck no. Nobody gives a shit about rich, out of touch people uh, endorsing someone. The only reason why they care about the podcast uh, route is because people have a deep and personal connection with uh, podcasters. They have a parasocial relationship with their podcasters. And on top of that, it's not just the podcasters themselves. They get to see a humanized version of this politician that they might vote for. Donald Trump in this circumstance. Celebrity endorsements don't have juice. They don't have motion. It don't mean shit. Simple common sense. What they want is a meaningful, measurable change from the past. And she's talking about having no difference in her policies versus Joe Biden. The Democrats have to do this examination. And it's not about getting angry with Donald Trump. It's figuring out exactly the words, the phrase. I'll also take it one step further. This is a quote that I saw earlier on my timeline. During the Vietnam War, every respectable artist in this country was against the war. It was like a laser beam. We were all aimed in the same direction. The power of this weapon turns out to be that of a custard pie dropped from a stepladder six feet high. In a C, weren't you very dismissive about the whole Trump's going on podcast thing? No, originally when he did the Aiden Ross thing, I was. 
because that didn't track as like positive media overall. But the Theo Vaughn podcast was what changed my perception of everything. Because he very quickly after the Aiden Ross thing went on Theo Vaughn. And I was like, oh my God, this is getting him in front of a lot of people. And it's making him look like a human being and not like a monster. Um, that's when I realized like this is going to be dangerous. Outside of that, however, there's two different ways of looking at the podcast route, podcast bro route. There's a manosphere out there that has uh, tremendous weight. Okay. There's like these people are not directly in the tank for Trump in many instances, but it doesn't matter. Like the politics that they represent and the communities that they foster are inherently antagonistic towards, you know, women and other, a variety of different, like other marginalized communities. They don't have to openly come out and be in the tank for Donald Trump to present a, yeah, well, Chris, uh, to, to present an outward right-wing community and, and cultivate said community. And they exist in this ecosystem where they do sometimes end up cross-pollinating audiences between like people who are directly in the tank for Donald Trump, people who are directly uh, podcasters and, and independent media figures that are uh, Republican Party operatives, such as like the Daily Wire. OK, that's also the reason why I said it would be great if Kamala Harris went on Joe Rogan, despite the fact that I don't think she would be able to present herself in the same uh, human way that Donald Trump was able to, just, you know, even though he rambles a lot. You give charitable takes on both sides, which is why I love it here. You don't deserve the hate you get. Most people who hate on you haven't ever been in for a while on stream. It's crazy how much they watch a little clip and assume. Love you. Yeah, I also speak for eight to ten hours every single day on politics, polarizing issues. Uh, and because of that, it's very easy to clip something completely out of context. Like this was a major problem with Joe Rogan originally early on. He would complain about this all the time where he's like, I'm talking free flow for three hours. Okay. You can, in that process, always misunderstand me. It is what it is. There's not much I can do. And, uh, there are still people who are, you know, very much invested in making a dollar here and there to do this, this kind of shitty smear job. And there's definitely always, as my community has grown, as my career has become more successful, my haters uh, and, the, and the communities that they've cultivated have also gotten larger. To expand on that Vonnegut quote, my dissertation is completely about how art would currently is catered to the liberal safety net of critique. When any farther left critique occur occurs, it's celebrated, yes, but then is co-opted by capital and inherently neutered by collector tax racket space. And you said it, not just Donald Trump winning the election, but winning the popular vote. First time in two decades for a Republican. And how did he do it? He did it by transforming the Republican Party. It is now more diverse than it's ever been in modern times and certainly much more than when Donald Trump first came on the scene eight years ago. A lot of ways to look at this. How about this year? When it says pre-Trump, that's the last presidential election. Someone called you a scumbag and it literally made me laugh out loud because you're just one of the most consistently passionate and I assume you meant not terrible creators. It makes me curious to even see your hate videos because I can't imagine. No, if, if you don't watch me at all, if you don't understand what my worldview is at all, 100%, if you only watch hate videos, you would think I'm a scumbag. Yeah, it makes sense. 400,000. Blame everyone except the politician running the campaign in Lamont. I don't understand why people are so obsessed with not hurting a politician's feelings. I mean, she did only have a hundred days campaign against the guy who's been campaigning for almost a decade. I'm like, we didn't even get a little slogan. It doesn't seem like there's liberals crying in the chat, in the replies. Yeah, that's how hate videos work, though. Media literacy does not exist in America. Also, if you're busy all the fucking time and you watch like a short little 20 minute video of like, you know, brief snippets that are framed in a very specific direction. Uh, yeah, of course you're going to fucking despise me. I get that. I do. 20 minutes is short. Yeah, 20 minutes is short in comparison to an eight-hour stream, Chad. That's what I'm saying. Do you guys not get it? The funniest thing that I've experienced in my career is that I've, I've been very consistent throughout this entire process, right? Um, and one thing that I've noticed that's pretty funny is that the early resentments that people have towards me for being right but too early still carry on even if they come to agree with my position i'll give you an example i'm sure that there are a shit ton of people who are xqc fans or former xqc fans now who still fucking despise me because i was like kick is is bad stake is bad cryptocurrency uh, you know cryptocurrency casino is bad right and it's going to poison your own content and it's going to uh, you know slowly but surely like isolate you alienate you that sort of thing, right? And there are, and because of that, I got primed against like pretty fucking hard, right? 
uh, Hisan and the like. People were just like spamming that all the time. That was like a huge thing on the platform. He was the largest at the time. He was the largest content creator on the platform. So every time he shit on me, of course, a lot of people who love him were like, yeah, he's right. This guy fucking sucks. So even though, even though ironically enough, they might now be former ACC fans who are like, yeah, the gambling stuff like really broke him uh, or whatever. They still also fucking despise me because the early resentment that they had towards my position, which they've now arrived at, has still carried on. And that's it. I don't even fault people for that either. Okay? It is what it is. It's so funny to have like a guy be like, I fucking hate you, dog, and not really examine why. And not really ask themselves why, because if they were to do so, they would be like, wait a minute, I kind of agree with that assessment now. <laughs> Maybe I should reconsider. You know what I mean? It is what it is. And it's not just XU, I just use them as one example. There's a million different examples of this. Before Donald Trump started running, you got to go back to 2012 for that. Remember, three straight elections, Trump's been the Republican candidate. So pre Trump, voters under 30 were. They will say you were so right about Kamala being a turd and thought you were wrong, but now they know you were right. But I think you made those 20 million stay at home and should have shut up till the election. Yeah. Yeah. People don't understand that at the time when I was making, people don't understand that at the time when I was making those criticisms, I was making them because I wanted Kamala Harris to present a stronger candidacy against Donald Trump. I wanted, well, I wanted the Democratic Party not to be like right wing on immigration regardless, because I think it's fucking bad politics and bad policy. But, you know. It is what it is. We're going for the Democrats by 23 points. Folks with incomes under 50,000, 22 points for the Democrats. Folks without college degrees, four points for the Democrats. That's pre-Trump. What comes out of this election? Look at some of these shifts. The youth vote, that Democratic margin cut more than in half. Voters under 50,000, now a Republican constituency. Voters without a college degree, look at that shift. Now a core Republican constituency. And then we can talk about race ethnicity. This gets into that diversity I mentioned a minute ago. Check this out. Again, pre-Trump versus now. The black vote still overwhelmingly Democratic, but that's a 15-point shift. It used to be 87 points for the Democrats, down to 72. How about this? You've heard a lot about it this week. This is what the numbers look like. Hispanic voters were 44 Oof. points Democratic before Donald Trump. Now, basically a toss-up constituency. And Asian Americans, a 32-point shift there as well. That's what one thing to also consider in these uh, uh, in these conversations is not necessarily okay, is not necessarily that like people who are Asian or Hispanic went from like voting for uh, Joe Biden to vo then voting for Donald Trump, and there are still plenty of people that did that for sure. But the reason why the percentages look like that is because the Democrats never Trump has never said Latinx. Neither has the Democrats. Shut the fuck up. Okay. Kamala Harris not once said fucking Latinx. Maybe at most like back in like 2019 or some shit. But she has not said that. She literally went to Guatemala in like the month of April in 2021 and was like, do not come. Do not come here. I, we hate you. Do not come. Okay. Stop fantasizing. Stop hallucinating what Democrats are saying and then like make these false assessments. What are you, a fucking Democratic Party campaign staffer? Are you a Democratic Party consultant? Is that what happened? Why are you defending the Dems? And their fucking campaign failures by pointing to a thing that they didn't do. God forbid we take a fucking cold, hard look at ourselves. You know what I mean? Holy shit. Nope. Can't do that. So the problem here, as I was trying to explain the numbers or the data behind the numbers is that it's not necessarily that like all of these people went from voting for Joe Biden to voting for Trump. I'm sure there were Trump to, I mean, Biden to Trump uh, uh, voters for sure. The problem is the base overall that the Democratic Party would activate regularly within the Hispanic Latino population, within the Asian population, within the black population, they just didn't fucking vote, okay? They didn't. They did not vote. And when they do not vote, then yeah, and, and the Republicans still turn out the same base, or maybe even turn some people from the Democratic Party's base, what's happened to the Republican Party since Donald Trump became its standard bearer eight years ago. This has been the movement. It's so funny also is like, have you seen the accusations of hacking? Yes, I've seen a lot of liberals trying to cope. And in that sea of cope, they have decided 
to uh, do the Republican thing and just like make stuff up. Stable Ronaldo, less debate. Bro, you'll cook me. I'm fearful. I'm scared. Take a look at get your reaction on the other side. He, Bernie Sanders has not won. Let me, with all due respect, and I have a great deal of respect for him, for what he stands for, but I don't respect him saying that the Democratic Party has abandoned the working class families. Senator, how do you respond to Nancy Pelosi? Well, Nancy's a friend of mine, and we've worked together on many issues. But here is the reality. I have to say to Nancy, uh, in the Senate in the last two years, we have not even brought forth legislation to raise the minimum wage to a living wage, despite the fact that some 20 million people in this country are working for less than $15 an hour. Uh, in America today, we have not brought, in the Senate, we have not brought to the floor the PRO Act to make it easier for workers to join unions. We're not talking about defined benefit pension plans so that our elderly can retire with security. We're not talking about lifting the cap on Social Security so that we can extend the solvency of Social Security and raise benefits. Bottom line, if you're an average working person out there, do you really think that the Democratic Party is going to the mats, taking on powerful special interest and fighting for you? I think the overwhelming answer is no. And that is what has got to change. Thanks for watching. Stay up. Um, yeah, we'll get to Bernie in a second. Let's see the let's see the the way that like the Republican base has become more diverse. And then out after that, we'll get to Bernie's uh, defense of himself. And meanwhile, for the Democratic Party, the story is the opposite. Pre-Trump versus now. Check out some of these movements. Uh, among white voters, this was a 20-point Republican constituency before Trump. Still a Republican constituency, but a little bit less so. And white voters are such a massive share of the electorate. That four-point shift, very meaningful. Again, college-educated voters now, a core Democratic constituency. Folks, earning more than $100,000, used to be a Republican constituency, now a Democratic constituency. And this gets to, we talk all about the battlegrounds. Trump swept the battlegrounds. But the other big story this week has to do with the popular vote and how Trump pulled that off. Here's one answer. Big blue states with very diverse populations. This new coalition that Donald Trump's assembled, it meant that he didn't win any of these but he made some giant strides. California, biggest of them all, 29 point Biden win four years ago, currently only 18 for Harris, her home state. Look at New York, basically Trump cutting that Democratic margin in half. Go down this list and look inside those states and you'll see it. Blue collar areas, cities, metro areas with large Hispanic populations. That's where Trump made his big gains there. We'll land on this one map, one battleground state that I think tells the story of these two coalitions here visually. Let's call up Wisconsin. We know in this election, Wisconsin went to Donald Trump. You're looking at a pre-Trump election because I just want to show you this is what a battleground state like Wisconsin looked like not that long ago. When Barack Obama reigned and carried the state over John McCain, look at all the blue here. So many of these are small rural counties with blue collar populations. Barack Obama could sweep almost all these counties. Democrats were competitive here. John McCain was like, John McCain was a pivotal uh, point for the Republican Party. Under the Obama administration, the Republicans actively did the Tea Party caucus, which was, again, led by the Koch brothers at the time, now Koch brother, because the other one died. But John McCain was the old school, uh, I would say, country club Republican, more moderate in a lot of positions, whereas they wanted to, they wanted to basically hyper-focus on a base that was growing, and and they wanted to prime them. So what did they do? McCain was the last last Bush Republican. Yeah, you mean George H. W. Bush though, not George W. Bush. Because I would go so far as to say that George W. Bush was like an in between a country club Republican and the Tea Party Republican, the Tea Party style Republican. If we were to bracket the Republican Party, there's like two different aspects to it. Back in the day, you had the William F. Buckley style elitist Republicans who would talk about melting the poor very openly. And, uh, and, and they, they were the, the party of the elite. Okay. Then Ronald Reagan kind of, uh, Ronald Reagan was the first shot of swapping that out for like a, uh, a yokel assault of the earth type person. He was an actor. So I think he was able to basically, uh, fit that role, but he still had that country club attitude. Okay. Despite being a massive populist. 
George H.W. Bush, on the other hand, was very much so the boring, lame-ass, nerd, country club Republican. And then George W. Bush was somewhere in between again. Okay? H.W. came after Reagan. No, I'm, I'm explaining to you how, the, how over the years they leaned more and more into uh, the, the populist Tea Party, outwardly racist, dare I say stupid, uh, version of the party. Okay, George W. Bush was somewhere in between because he was, uh, you know, also presenting himself as a salt of the earth type person, uh, kind of goofy, kind of silly, kind of telegenic, kind of charismatic. Uh, and I think that after that, the Republican Party tried to get back to the old method with John McCain and then to even less success. They thought John McCain lost because of Sarah Palin. So they brought forward an even more country club style Republican with Mitt Romney. OK, Obama won both times. Uh, and then uh, the rest is history. Obviously, you know, the rest, you were there for it. Trump full tilt went right wing populist full tilt. No more country club Republican bullshit. And for seemingly all of the people that left the party in the t at that time frame, you know, the, the Lincoln uh, project people, the former Obama administration consultants, went and found themselves comfortably in the confines of the Democratic Party and have actively tried to change uh, the Democratic Party and successfully have changed the Democratic Party into the image of the Country Club Republican Party. But Romney was a Country Club Republican too, which I think ultimately may have been the last straw for Republican insiders who kept losing on the elitist strategy. No, the Republican strategists still wanted to run Country Club Republicans. What do you mean? And they still are trying to run country club Republicans. They just fail because Donald Trump owns them. There was 18. There were 18 candidates on that fucking stage. You had the classic like weirdos that existed in the Republican primaries as well in the past. You know, the flat tax defenders and people of that sort. But then you had Donald Trump. But if you think about it, most of the people that Donald Trump eviscerated with the exception of like a Ben Carson type was uh, most of the people that Donald Trump destroyed were like Marco Rubio, Jeb Bush. He destroyed them. He destroyed the country club Republicans. He was like, no, you're done. And then although they were originally against uh, Trump's reign, right? They had to concede because they were like, we have an election that we, we must win. Ironic, I know, because Donald Trump does own country clubs, but he is not a country club Republican. Come on. Ironic, because he is not only a country club owner, but he is also personally a billionaire, which is exactly what country club Republicans were, were you know, trying to uh, aesthetically represent. Old money types who speak a certain way. So Donald Trump basically smacked the shit out of the rest of the lineup and completely dominated the Republican Party and changed it by force to suit his own vision. That did not stop the Republicans from trying to actively moderate him and bring the party back to their own vision, their own desires. That's why they slapped him with Mike Pence, who was a freak and a phony and a weird evangelical born-again Christian nut job. Having said that, he was very much in the pocket of the Koch brothers. We saw how that ended. And then this last primary cycle, what did they try to do? They literally held separate conferences for Ron DeSantis. They thought Ron DeSantis is our guy. Then they were like, okay, maybe Nikki Haley is our guy. Donald Trump destroyed them as well. And that's it. He forced them to submit once again. Oh. The Democrats in the process, I know it sounds insane to say, but I believe the Democrats would have beat Trump if they selected a man. No, I can't. I still can't believe someone as sauce as Nikki Haley tried to run. If Nikki Haley was on the ticket, I think she would have done as good as a job as Donald Trump, if not maybe even a better job, honestly. Because why go for the diet version when you have the real thing still comes to mind? Especially when Kamala Harris saw Nikki Haley and literally... Re changed like tried to emulate Nikki Haley she was seemed like this general election was going to be the Republican primary 2.0 and in some respects it was 
That's exactly what happened. Take a look at this map, and I'm going to call up what just happened this week. All that blue has become, look at all that red. All of those blue-collar areas with Donald Trump as the Republican uh, leader for the last eight years have moved this dramatically to the Republicans, and it's left the Democrats relying more than ever on areas like Madison, Wisconsin, Milwaukee County, areas that have uh, large populations of voters with college degrees, of higher-income voters, of progressive voters. And in this election, uh, uh, Kristen, it just wasn't enough uh, for the Democrats to lean on that when they've lost so much ground with blue-collar voters elsewhere. Steve, it is just striking to look at that map of Wisconsin and, frankly, all the results that you laid out. Now, look, the results are in. They're not going to change. It is worth noting there is still counting going on. Yeah, I mean, if you remember from 2020, uh, uh, it took about a month till we got all the national popular vote. And let me just show you nationally here. One thing we're waiting on big. We know California is a Harris state. But as I said, still some votes to come. Seventy five percent is in. That means there are millions more votes just from California. And there are other states like this. A lot of it has to do with vote by mail. Those ballots taking a long time for some of these states. So when you look at where the current popular vote stands, you know, you've got there probably another 10 million or so when all is said and done are going to be added to this. This has been the story for a while in states like California. They take a very long time. All right, let's hear what Senator- Bernard had to do. He went through he went through the fucking Sunday circuit. Bernie.